besides people who walk in the rain and act like it's not raining. I mean, at least acknowledge the rain. Hurry your step, <laughs> cower, extend your arms, whatever. Or people who cut you off in traffic and drive really, really slow. Yeah. Besides those things, what really irks me are movies and television shows with one-dimensional characters. You've seen them, right? The bad guy, the bad guy, is bad just because he's Dr. Evil. And the good guy, the good guy, is good, so good, so perfect, actually, that you kind of dislike him. And we realize that these people rarely exist in the real world. Early in my writing career, I took a workshop where the teacher had us complete these very extensive character breakdowns before we even approached our story. And they resembled questionnaires, and they asked questions like age and occupation, but they also probed for needs and wants and desires. The point being that as writers, we should know these characters in and out. And we more, most importantly should be able to connect the characters' actions with something related to their personality, their backgrounds, their history. The point was to make these characters as real and human as possible. Because we know that humans are complex creatures, right? We're not black and white. We live in the grays. And we come to this world with baggage and childhoods and cultural and environmental influences that shape how we think, act, and perceive the world. Great storytelling does this, though. It goes to the story beyond the story and uncovers the complexities of characters and shows those layers of background. Last week, when I should have been doing important things like preparing for my TEDx talk, <laughs> I was binge watching TV. Who's been there? OK, thank you. <laughs> and you know when you say binge watching these days, you know that a significant amount of time has been invested. So I invested a significant amount of time watching a show called Shameless. Has anyone seen this show? Yes. OK, so I'll give you a quick synopsis. Um, Shameless stars William H. Macy as Frank Gallagher. Frank is a single father of six kids, and the kids range from like infant to 21. And they pretty much take care of themselves because when Frank is not at the local bar getting drunk, he's scheming ways to make money to buy more alcohol. On top of that, he's a narcissist. He's completely politically incorrect, and he takes dysfunction to an extraordinary level. Imagine like the, the biggest jerk you know, times that by 100, that's Frank Gallagher. But these, these kids have managed to survive and craft this very tight family unit. And as the narrative unfolds, you learn that Frank's wife left him, and he kind of had a nervous breakdown. So you understand just a little bit better. You still don't like him, but you understand a little bit better. But what you're really led to is empathy for these, for these children, and they are far from the Brady Bunch. They are not wholesome. They have questionable moral, moral leanings. They scheme and steal as well, but you know that they're doing it to survive because there's no one there to take care of them. And you know this because you see their day to day. You see their struggles. You see their complexities. And you're encouraged to follow along with them on this journey in front of your television for hours upon hours. But then when you turn the television off and you walk into the real world and you encounter real people with real problems, we tend to hit pause on our empathy. We walk past the young men on the corner and label them trouble, not concerned with their whys. We walk around the homeless woman, not concerned with her how. We relegate real people to one-dimensional characters not worthy of our deep attention. What if, though, we thought about real people the way we think about characters in our favorite television shows, films, and books? There was a time in my life when I boycotted Father's Day. In content rebellion, I would not call the man who got my mother pregnant. That's actually how I would refer to him as well. <laughs> I sometimes would, out of spite, would call my mother and wish her a happy, happy Father's Day. It was my way of punishing him for dropping out of my life. Because at one point, I was the biggest daddy's girl. I mean, I would lay in his arms, and I knew what it meant to be loved. Um, he was like the big brother I never had. We'd watch cartoons and wrestling. This is when cartoons would come on early in the morning, and then wrestling would follow on Saturday mornings. And we would have so much fun together. But I wasn't the only one he impressed. My uh, third grade classmates would say, your father is so cool, when he would come with us on field trips. 
But the truth is, my father was a professional BSer. He could sell heaters in hell. I think at one point he was selling heaters in a really hot place. <laughs> <laughs> Between his college psychology degree and his successful career as a salesman who rose up the ranks of a major corporation, my father could tell you what you wanted to hear. And this talent allowed him and afforded him the ability to buy a big old house in a covenant neighborhood in New Jersey for his family, to buy a sports car, a Corvette that he always wanted and that my preschool friends would rush to the window to watch drive off. He would have even the most reasonable people unloading their pockets to buy things they didn't want or need. It is a dangerous talent. But towards the end of elementary school and as I went into junior high school, the bright picture of my family began to turn static. My father was a drug addict. His drug addiction finally took the starring role in his life and pushed all his loved ones to the side on the stage to watch him lose everything. His high paying job, his house, his car, his wife, his children, his self esteem, his confidence, that was 1991. By the time I entered high school, I was just bitter. It was like my part-time job, like I'm bitter, that's what I was. <laughs> and I became addicted to my own obsession of how my father ruined my life. And I let that usher into my, well into my 20s. The only way that I could describe him was deadbeat and addict. I could not see past those one dimensions. But then as I got older, I became tired of being, I became tired of being tired, I became sick of being sick. And I realized that I didn't really know my father. I didn't know him. So I did what any writer does, and I started a book project. And when I did that, and during that process, I came across this photo. That is my father in 1964, and he's 18 years old. I had seen this picture before, but at that moment in time, it looked different. This time I saw hope, and I saw possibility, and I saw potential, and I thought about his whys, and his hows, and his whats. I wanted to fill in the blanks, so I removed myself from being the protagonist and the very simple story that I crafted for myself, and I became the storyteller. I began interviewing my father and learning about his story. And let me tell you, talk about conflict and drama and characters, Frank Gallagher has nothing on my father. I learned about a troubled childhood and upbringing. I learned about mistakes and regrets. I learned about dreams and unfulfilled promises. I also learned about addiction and how it is a brain disease that impacts more than 23 million Americans, not including their families. Me wanting to wish him or will him to, to quit was not enough. In my work as, well, when I was actually able to give him the benefit of the doubt that I give characters on television, my perspective changed. I contextualized my father. He went from deadbeat dad to a more full-bodied, living, troubled human being. In my work as a writer, producer, and strategist, I tout that we are all storytellers. We, in the global sense, because storytelling goes across cultures and across time. In his book, The Art of Immersion, Frank Rose discusses how our brain recognizes patterns and how stories are recognizable patterns where we find meaning. He also discusses a 1944 study of 34 college students who were shown a short film and asked to describe what they saw. The film had two triangles, a circle moving across a surface, a rectangle that was stationary but was slightly open. One student described the short film as geometric shapes moving across a plane. But most students came up with narratives to describe what they saw. One story was the two men, which were triangles, were fighting. And the woman, which was a circle, was uh, trying to get away from one of them. They even attached emotions to the objects. The circle was worried. The circle. The circle was worried. <laughs> we go into this world 
with this innate ability and propensity to tell stories to explain the world around us. And we see it being filled with characters with emotions. Empathy is the ability to sh understand and share the feelings of another. Story storytelling has the power to uncover the humanity of those around us, to dismantle stereotypes, and to show us how we're connected in life's great narrative. Me and my father's story has a happy ending. He and I have a wonderfully health healthy relationship. He slayed a dragon, and he is one of my living heroes, faults and all. The best stories come from the most riveting characters who are sitting next to us, who are behind us in the grocery line, who we walk past on the street, and who are in our families if we only give them the attention and respect that they deserve. Thank you.